Welcome everyone to Roundtable 3, the intersection of people and the Rocky Intertidal, hosted by USC Sea Grant and Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. So before we get started, I just want to go over some housekeeping. During the roundtable, um, this webinar is in, in basically webinar format. The audience is automatically muted and the video is off. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. You can see this with the little chat box right here on the right to ask questions for the panelists. Use the chat box on the far left to ask questions for USC Sea Grant or Cabrillo Marine Aquarium specifically. You can also raise your hand if you have a question. Um, also, please note that the roundtable is being recorded so that we can share this with a larger audience afterwards. And for now, I'm going to pass it off to Julie Passarelli to introduce our guest panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Melody. Well, hello and welcome to the final evening of our three-part Rock Intertidal Community Roundtable series, organized in partnership between USC Sea Grant and Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. I'm Julie Passarelli, the Education and Collections Curator at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. The aquarium is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks, and we are so grateful for the city's brief support. Um, we would also like to thank Aquarium Director Kristen McCarran and thank you to Phyllis Griffin, Associate Director of US USC Sea Grant for their support. And a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. Before we get started, I would also like to acknowledge Linda Chilton from USC Sea Grant and Jim DePompe, the Programs Director at Cabrillo and Aquarium for all their hard work putting all three of these events together. The purpose, purpose of these round tables have been to bring together a variety of voices and expertise to discuss a complex topic and to address the recent activity in the tide pools along the Palos Verdes Peninsula. The, the first panel was understanding the changing intertidal and address the science and what we know about the rocky intertidal habitat. And the second panel was on management policy and enforcement in the rocky intertidal. If you missed either of these, uh, they are now posted on Cabrillo and Aquarium and USC Sea Grants websites. Tonight's topic is the inter intersection of people and the rock inner title. We hope to emphasize that the, the key to education and outreach is communication. Engaging the community is an important component of this roundtable, and we encourage everyone to share their thoughts and ideas. And now with that, I would like to introduce Linda Chilton from USC Sea Grant. Thank you very much, Julie, and thank you for all of your work in helping make these roundtables be as, as informative and engaging as they are. And um, we're gonna do things a little bit differently tonight and part of it is, is recognizing we're really fortunate to have a student who also needs to get to class. So we're going to start out with Steffi Gann. She is a master's in fine arts student at the USC um, School of Cinematic Arts in the area of animation. She's in her second year. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from Barnard College, Columbia University. And this last summer, she spent the summer as an artist in residence at the Wrigley Institute. We feel really fortunate that her expertise um, was lent to this topic of the Rocky Intertidal and really excited to bring her to you today. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce Steffi Gann to all of you. Thank you, Linda, and thanks, Julie. Um, so I'm excited to be here to just talk more about animation um, as a form of communication tool. Um, one of the reasons why I went to grad school was to really um, hone in on um, this, this idea of animation as an education um, and advocacy tool. And I'm really glad to be able to work with Linda um, and Wrigley on communicating um, you know, ideas about sustainability and climate change and also being very specific in the research too. Like for me, this was the first time I'm learning about the details of um, life at the intertidal and, um, and really informed the way that I, I animated and, and also showed, we, we have a clip tonight for you to look at as well. Um, and, and this really came from, um, you know, I wasn't always an animation major, but I, um, studied a lot of um, things that I cared a lot about 
um, like sustainability. Um, I went to a women's college and we also talk about female empowerment and, um, and other things. And I actually went into animation because of a filmmaker, um, Hayao Miyazaki. I'm sure um, some, some of you might be um, aware of his work, um, but his work was really just magical. And, and his work was actually um, a big inspiration for a piece that I made over the summer. Um, Ponyo was one of his films and it, it portrayed um, life in the sea and, and just the abundance of um, magical, of sea life and also the interaction with humans and um, and and his other films um, also have similar messaging and every time I watch his films I always think wow wouldn't it be great if the world was like this because it's just beautiful and and that really inspired me to it, it made me care so much about the themes that he talks about um, pacifism is also one of his themes um, that I felt like this was there was really a lot of power in animation and media. Um, and so I was an architecture major and I was doing design. Um, and then I really wanted to go into um, a medium that really communicated with people. So after college, I actually did some of this work. Um, I did a reading campaign for Scholastic and we went into talking about the joy and adventures of reading, um, how how words and stories can really be brought to life um, and, and the wonders of that. Um, and also the other experiences like creating um, funny things around money to get people to understand financial concepts, um, for example. And, and you know, those were really different ways that I sharpened this idea of how do you communicate something that people might not um, look at you know, there, there are different ways that people have been communicating these messages, but animation as a tool really allows people to think about it differently um, and also in a more fun and engaging way and also using comedy comedy and and just, just the beauty in what you're seeing. Um, and I find that that's, you know, a way that artists can really interact with people and, and also get some reactions and um, their feedback. <laughs> um, so, I was I was inspired a lot by just a lot of artists who use art as an advocacy tool um, and also just to get us thinking about things um, differently and, and I want to do that more with my work. Um, yeah, if there are any questions tonight that I, I'll be happy to answer as well. Um, you know, some of my work that I'm doing now in school is related to a lot of these themes of um, there's also immigration and there are a lot of hard topics that um, you know, I want to address using using um, one of these skills, writing and art and and um, in a short form, because a lot of these, um, you know, in animation specifically, it's it's really small tidbits that you can get. You can really tell a story and condense time and tell it within like a minute or two. Um, and I always found that it was powerful to be able to do that. Um, of course, the production process doesn't take that, you know, it takes a longer time to produce that minute or two minutes. Um, but it's, it's, you know, become digestible for someone who's watching and um, to kind of get them in. So, you know, one of the things that I learned um, as an animator is, you know, besides the visual is also this idea of storytelling. Um, and, you know, even in this project, we think about kind of what is the story or what is the the um, message that we would want people to leave with and that becomes the guiding principle of actually how do you structure a, you know the, the whole film around it and and you know that that message is probably um where i believe should be spent you know the most of the time into thinking about that message before going into the production process because that's a whole different process um, but it's really you know for me it starts with the idea i think story is very important um the writing the pre before you even go into making something um to really think about um you know how is this going to speak to people and how is this going to come off across um and um so I don't know, Linda, when um, we would like to share the clip. Um, yeah, if you're ready, I think Mel can share it for you now. Yeah, so um, we can share um, the work that um, I did this summer. Um, it's still not completely finished, but you can get the idea of it.
I don't think the audio is playing, but the... no audio, Steffi. I'm not hearing the audio on on my I'm end. Um, I'm gonna try. If it. There's a way to share um, using computer audio that might be that might work. the controls real quick. While she's getting it ready, there's a question, Je um, Steffi, of Jessica asks, I'm really just curious, I'm really curious about your work and how you relate to hard topics. So I don't know if you want to talk more on that as, as she's getting it ready and Mel interrupt us when, when you're set. Sure. Um, how, how I relate to hard topics, I mean, I can um, answer it how I, I interpret the question, um, but for me, I, I live, <laughs> I think it's part of just the, my philosophy in life in general. Um, I consider myself an, adv an advocate and, um, and a lot of these themes that I am working on in my art, I'm actually doing in my life as well. Like I'm trying, in all aspects of my life, um, trying to continue to um, speak to people, um, even friends or family about themes like climate change, like actually trying to use, doing like a plastic audit, doing all those things and trying to, um, you know, activate my community um, to be politically active on voting for policies that are better for us and things like that. So um, it's really just part of, um, things I already believe in, and then art is one of the tools to continue to spread, you know, like um, engage in that way. Um, so that's that's how I engage with it. Um, and it's really, you know, I have friends who aren't artists who work on similar um, things, and they do it in their different ways um, through writing or even through um, research or um, et cetera. So I think this is just my something I bring to the table using art and. Um, animation. All right, I'm going to try playing it one more time. I'm not sure what's going on, um, but we can also try sharing Linda's screen. Okay. Yeah. Keeps jumping back and forth. Is that is that great? Right, yes. Yeah. Playing. Okay, good. I'm going to leave it like this then.
And I believe Linda also has a link to it um, um, on the Wrigley website for people who want to um, watch it. I think I sent it to everyone in the, in the chat. Great. Do, are there folks who have questions for Steffi before she has to get to class? Please go ahead and enter those in the question and answers. I know I can personally watch it over and over and, and the music really adds to the element of, of just realizing how much um, biodiversity there is in the inner title and how it's all interconnected. Um, and what we do is interconnect is, is connected very, very closely with what's happening in the inner title. So it's exciting to see what is is coming if you're as you're making changes each time is more exciting. So it's been really wonderful having you as an artist in residence. Um, I think we'd all like to stretch it out as long as we can. Yeah, thank you so much, Linda. And I learned so much just working with researchers, too, because um, there's just so much diversity that I didn't even portray the, you know, all, I only portrayed a little bit of, of what can exist in the intertidal. And yeah, just, just being engaged in this process is, and just learning so much. And also it informs the work as well. Yeah, and you've got lots of folks, lots of admirers. Um, and we'll make sure to share those comments with you. Claudia asks if you've gotten feedback from the public on this animation. Um, so we haven't um, shared it to um, wide, the wide public yet because it's um, not completely finished, um, but we will share it soon. I have gotten feedback from my animation friends already and um, they think it's really cute. So <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. Okay. And the students we've shared it with during the summer programs have been both, both enthused, but there's also been a lot of questions um, from the students to find out more about um, what, what's that animal and why is that doing that? Um, so it, it triggers curiosity, which is, is really, really valuable as we approach new concepts and ideas. Yeah, that's great. And, um... Yeah, I know I had that experience too when I watched um, the animation I was talking about, just um, all the creative things you can do. And then at this, that inspires um, inspired me whenever I watch sort of fanciful animation and think, oh, is that real? Like, I want to do more research and find, you know, find out um, kind of the, the, yeah, the story behind it. Do you have time for one more question? Do you need to head to class? Um, I'm, I have time for one more question. Yeah. Okay. Nicole is wondering if you could please speak a little about the process for taking dense scientific topics and turning them into short digestible animations or other content. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say the, the inspiration part was a big, um, was a big part of why this became the way it did. And I really latched onto this idea of portraying, um, magic, um, just this word was the theme of it, um, because nature is just so amazing and, and especially the oceans, it's just so abundant. And um, whenever I get moved by seeing a piece of animation from my influences, I would think, wow, that's amazing. And because especially the ocean and the intertidal, um, when people don't actually go and see it in real life or they have seen it in real life it um you know this really adds to a whole level of imagination we think wow that that does exist and it doesn't look exactly like that but it, you can really play with the colors and the life of it because um you might not be able, especially in the t intertidal you might not be able to see um the movements of um these li living organisms um when if you're looking at it but but really there is a, a lot of movement um, over time and, and really to give it personality. So we really wanted to show the magic and inspire people to really want to care and um, do more research about the area, ask more questions. Um, and that's kind of how we came to this, this moment, just portraying what happens um, in this, when the waves come in and then when the waves go out. And, and also this idea of plankton being, or water being a, 
rich source of nutrients. Um, and plankton, you don't usually see it in water, but they, they have a lot of life and I decided to animate them in a very kind of fun way because I'm curious about these um, little creatures that are, um, you know, that are very delicate um, in our ocean. Thank, thank you for the question. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Do you want one more? Do you want to go to class? Um, I can answer, I can answer a few more questions. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Um, what do you use to make or create your animation from Parker? Yes, um, so I use, um, I've been using Adobe program, so Adobe Animate and then After Effects. Um, Adobe Animate is a hand-drawn tool, so I just draw frame by frame, um, and that's sort of the, the short answer to that, it's this, um, Adobe software. And yes, I can give you my email, I see another question. Um, so for people who want to follow up, Thank you, Steffi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and yes, so thank you, Linda. And thank you for um, all the questions that were asked. And, and if other people have questions, um, you're okay with following up and, and we'll get the answers back to people in the future. Sure. Okay, sure. thank you so much for making time and hope that your class this evening is a wonderful one. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Bye-bye, thank you. And as, as Steffi heads off to class, we, we want to move a little bit backwards before we go forwards and, and absolutely um, respectfully acknowledge that we're on the land of the Tonga, the Gabrieleno and Chumash peoples. And we wish to express gratitude and respect for the elders, past, present, and emerging. We honor the indigenous people who have been living, working, respecting and caring for this land that is the interface between land and the ocean from time immemorial. We wish to acknowledge that many of us are experiencing deep grief, fear, trauma, and devastation right now between the pandemic and accompanying economic downturn. Schools starting up virtually, devastating fires, and ongoing brutality against black and brown people this is an incredibly difficult time. The changes in human use of tide pool habitats that we've seen this spring and summer are profound and complex. It's been enormously valuable to learn about the ecosystems and habitats themselves from scientists who studied them for decades to gain a better understanding of policy, regulations, and management is equally valuable. And now as we move further forward into this next section, I think we need to all remember how essential it is to understand that the dimensions of human use are complex and varied. And the relationships we approach and how we communicate with those new relationships is an essential component of education and outreach. We're, we were unable tonight to bring a partner from the indigenous communities in our region to this panel, yet wish to acknowledge the models that they provide in living in relationship with the ocean and coast, with respect and responsibility for the ocean, recognizing the meaning of respect and responsibility for one another, including the environment, each other, and ourselves. I urge all of us to learn more from our indigenous partners and neighbors. If we look back in history, we must recognize people have always harvested from the shoreline. As we've learned, White Point is an example of one of the many areas impacted statewide. If we look at the early 1900s, White Point area was where Japanese immigrants were able to reclaim their cultural connection as abalone fishermen after first working on the railway. They were able to exist and make a living until this practice was outlawed specifically for the Japanese individuals. In 1976, the California Coastal Act reemphasized that as Californians, we believe access to all of the coast is a right for all. This is especially critical for those who have limited access to outdoor environments. We're aware that areas along the Southern California, such as 
the Inkle on Santa Monica, Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach and White Point where limited coastal access, where limited coastal access was allowed for groups otherwise excluded until black, indigenous, and other peoples of color were excluded from there as well. We must be concerned about exclusion, how people are welcomed and work to identify barriers, including parking, transit, or, or intimidation. We all go outside to recenter, especially in this difficult time. Nature helps us to heal, to cope with the challenges we face. And one of the big questions is, how do we work together to ensure all feel that nature, the coastline, is accessible while still working to maintain healthy coastal ecosystem and ecosystem biodiversity? It's a daunting challenge to develop education and outreach efforts that bring us together to create plans for resilience in the inner tidal and ensure biodiversity, especially at a time of changing climate. The diversity of talented educators guiding youth to visit the tide pools is slowly transforming to be more representative of those youth visitors. Materials are developed in multiple languages to reach broader audiences. And this engagement is essential but as an educator, I recognize this isn't enough. We must develop better connections within the diverse Los Angeles communities if we're to work together to ensure safe access, to share one's own culture, to share with one's own culture and friends and family, and to be welcome to connect to the coast and ocean. As we approach this final roundtable, outreach and education, it's important to remember that the people visiting the tide pools are not hom homogeneous, either in their demographics or purpose. Tonight, we hope to explore how we bridge the challenges faced by Black, Indigenous, and other peoples of color in accessing and feeling welcome to connect with and develop a relationship with the ocean. We look forward to exploring these concepts with all of you and hope that you'll continue to communicate and share your ideas and thoughts, questions and insights, so that we can ensure a discussion during this, this last session together. And with that, I'd, I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, um, Candace Dickens Russell oversees environmental sustainability, education and justice for do-goodery offering expertise in education for sustainable development. She's a JEDI leader. She develops training, organizational plans, and strategic partnerships in justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. She leads teacher engagement and professional development efforts and has served as the California Regional Environmental Education Community Coordinator in Los Angeles for over a decade. She has worked with thousands of teachers and schools designing equitable standards-based environmental education curriculum and programs for the state, regional, and local partners, and serves on several boards, advisory councils for educational organizations, and also serves on the USDC grant advisory board. She has a strong background in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and has provided expertise in this area to countless organizations. Um, she, is, she is a wonderful dear friend and colleague and, and someone who I so admire um, and am and just humbled to, to introduce and thank her again for joining us tonight. And with that, I would like to turn this over to Candace. Aw, thank you, Linda. That was so beautiful. I am so excited to be here tonight and just talk about this topic. This is something that, you know, we're seeing in the news and something that we're talking about amongst ourselves. And I really um, am grateful to be able to participate and to hopefully add something to the discourse. So as, as Linda mentioned, um, yeah, my background is in environmental education and uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice. Um, I actually studied sustainability and social justice hand in hand. So I kind of like to um, work at that intersection of diversity and the environment. So that environmental justice. So wherever you'll find education coming together with equity, coming together with the environment, you will find me because I that's where I live. 
And so um, I'm really excited to talk about this idea of how do we create um, an education education for everyone and an education that reaches everyone where they are. And it's it's not a one answer situation. It, it can be complex. Actually, if we go to the next slide, Julie. Um, really do find myself like at that at that intersection and it, there are so many kind of overlapping um, just kind of competing almost uh, priorities and overlapping ideas and what we want to do is try to pull those out and see where we where we need to move and where we need to contribute and always 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 listening always um, trying our very best to be good neighbors and trying our very best to find the ways that we want to move forward. So um, when we talk about the intersection of the environment and, and equity, we're talking about the ways in which we listen to people and help move things forward. Um, so when, I talk, when we talked about this issue, Linda and I, the issue of what's happening at the tide pools and the issue and the ideas of just how the way that people interact with the coast, these are not new ideas. These are not new issues. These are not new problems, but it does seem that some things are changing. And so I really wanted to have, you know, a dialogue about that tonight and to uh, talk a little bit about what we do at Do Goodery and what I do there and how we try to move these issues and issues like this forward. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, one of the things we talk about, and this is a quote from our dear friends and partners at Youth Outside, I encourage you to check them out as well, is this idea of what is cultural relevancy and how do we um, take culture into consideration. And this comes from uh, some research done back in, in the 90s about this idea that when you're creating um, any sort of curriculum, this is out of the education world, any sort of curriculum or, or teaching, how do people relate to it? Do people feel like this message is for me or is this message not for me? Do I need to be someone else, think like someone else, show up as someone else in order to get this? How does this really apply to me? How is this relevant to me? And so for many, many years, I worked as a director of environmental education for the County of Los Angeles Department of Public Works Generation Earth Program. And that's a program that works with you know, hundreds of thousands of students, literally, thousands of teachers, thousands of schools. And it's not good enough to um, just create something and say, hey, it's open to everybody, everybody can come in. That's equality. Equity is when we think about the audiences we want to reach and tailor our messages and tailor our outreach to be able to reach everyone and to invite everyone in. So it's, it's the equivalent, the way I always talk about it, in, in our workshops and in our, in, our, in our sessions is it's the equivalent of both opening the door and inviting people in. For some people, oh, the door's open, I may go in and they, and they will go in, but not all people will do that. It's opening the door and inviting people in. And so as we talk about how do we create communication around what's happening at the, at the tide pools, we talk about how do we invite everyone to the table? How do we hear everyone? How do we listen to everyone? So I wanted to share Youth Outside's uh, definition of cultural relevancy and, and making sure that we're taking into consideration the values of communities and really kind of thinking about those, those disparities of equity and inclusion. And Linda spoke beautifully about some of the exclusion that's happened in some of these places and, and the idea that, that some of those feelings and um, the results of those prevail, those, those those continue. And so we have to think about that when we're thinking about how do we create a dialogue? How do we create a conversation, especially an education campaign of any type? And that's, that's super important. Um, let's go to the next slide. One of the um, workshops that I teach at Do Goodery and that I love to do with groups is, is working with diverse communities. And by diverse, a lot of people think that means by Black, Indigenous, people of color, but it just means different kinds of communities, people who may be different than you. And so the first step in that really comes to understanding what are the needs? What, what are the needs in this community? Um, listening, listening, listening. I say that so many times in, in this particular workshop, listening, listening, and listening. Um, and then forming these strategic partnerships, which always um, 
recognize and acknowledge the people who are already working in these spaces, people who are already leading in these ways. How do we find out who those leaders are and how do we create strategic partnerships with them that respect their needs as well as our needs? Um, that's where true allyship comes in. This isn't a situation where we're coming in to save someone or coming in to tell someone what to do, but how do we create a partnership and an allyship? Um, instead, especially when it comes to navigating difficult past and perceptions, which Linda talked about and touched on, and co-designing the future. How do we co-design and work together to um, create a future that makes sense for everyone? So environmental education, you know, is, is my first love, and I've always been an eco geek since, you know, very, very young in middle school, starting the recycling program um, at my school in Cerritos. But um, in addition to that, when you can combine that love of taking care of nature and, and, and respecting nature with how people <laughs> need what people need and how people see the world, that is just like that sweet spot. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're always kind of thinking about both sides of the coin in, in the work that we do. I think I've got one more slide. So yeah, effective community education. So if I were to design, you know, and actually I have designed effective community education campaigns, what are some of the steps that I would, I would undergo and what are some of the things that I would think about? And it would definitely begin with listening, as I've, as I've said a few, quite a few times. Um, and I actually taught this workshop last week and again, the listening just comes up over and over again. In addition to that, having clear goals and objectives that are not just clear to the people who are doing the talking, but the people who are doing the listening as well. What is it that we want to do here? What are we trying to do and build together? Um, so much of the time, the, when, when organizations, nonprofits, you know, the, the sorts of people that I've worked with for many years, as Linda mentioned, I was the regional coordinator for environmental education for all of Los Angeles County for 12 years. And my goal, my job was to um, help all of the various environmental organizations, whether they were museums or aquariums or small nonprofits, work together and to best, better and best serve the teachers of Los Angeles County. And that really, really required um, a lot of, of partnership and coordination and active listening and having these clear goals and objectives. And so what I like to talk about is making sure that we're, we're super clear about what we want to do. And when an organization like these, these smaller nonprofits or a, an NGO, it asks me to consult with them and work with them, what I first have to do is ask, are these your goals? Are these the goals of the community? Is this something that you want to see happen or is this something the community actually cares about? And, and that getting super clear about that is, is really important. And from there, once we understand what the goals are of the community and, and how we get the community to listen to what we want, then we can go forward. Very often and unfortunately too often, there's a grant deadline or there's a deliverable that needs, or box, some box that needs to be checked and we go into the situation focused on our box and on what we want to see happen. And what needs to happen is an understanding of where the community is coming from. Um, and what is happening, which takes us to the next point, which is the understanding the perspectives and the needs. Not all communities are the same. So that's why we talk about diverse communities, all different kinds of communities. Um, they're not all the same. So how do we figure out what, their, what the priorities are of the communities we're hoping to work with? And how do we um, see how we can match those, 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 uh, those perspectives, those needs, those objectives up with ours? And one thing I always advise doing is a detailed and thorough landscape analysis. And one of the things that comes up in the landscape analysis, if you do it well, is history. And the history of a, com of a, of a community, history of an area is so telling because it's alive. It's alive in the people that are there now. It's not always just something that happened in the past. And so understanding what's happened before, to whom it happened, possibly, if possible, why it happened, and helping to really understand any, and unfortunately this happens a lot, broken promises, um, things that were, were supposed to happen that didn't happen, uh, ways that communities feel that they have not been listened to, heard, or failed, 
becomes extremely important when designing effective community education and designing effective partnerships. And so once you've done those things, I think when you when you show up with an open heart, open ears and, and put your box aside, um, try to understand perspective and needs, conduct that thorough landscape analysis, understand the history of what's happening, only then can you create this effective communication where everyone can hear each other. Um, in addition to that, the strategic partnerships where it's not about only what one group wants, but what, what, ev what serves everyone um, is super important. I often talk about meeting genuine community need. There, I cannot tell you how many times I've worked with an organization that wanted to go out and do something in the community and the community wanted no part of it, even if it was what was best for the community and the opinions of, of the people who wanted to do it. And also just like objectively, like this community needs this. Um, it's super important to meet genuine community need, cultural relevance, which we've already talked about. And then of course, to focus on sustainability. Sustainability being making sure that whatever you do can last, making sure that whatever you bring in can last. And that can mean so many things, but um, it's having a storyteller in the community that can tell the story of what happened there after, after it's all over with or it's, you know, company organizations often say, well, we have funding for this little bit of time working with this community, but then not forever and ever. It's taking that funding and putting in one hour a month for the next five years into one line item so that there's something happening in that community so you don't completely disappear once your project is over. There are so many ways to focus on sustainability. But these are the, um, the steps I would I would recommend in creating and developing effective community education programs and you know, always in thinking about what is the best way to bring justice, equity, and inclusion to this community. I think that's the last slide, Julie. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candace, and so much information. Um, for all of us to digest and hold the, the, what great steps and, and I'm glad that these are posted um, webinars so that people can refer back to them. And do you want to speak a little bit more about identifying community needs mm. and, and addressing those needs? Sure, happy to. Uh, the only way to do that, of course, is to listen. <laughs> and that's, that word comes up over and over again. And so when you, when an organization asks me to help work in a particular community, a first question I ask is, do they, do they want you there? Like, what do they want? What is it that the community is asking for, seeking, needing? Um, one way that I find really helpful is to partner with an existing organization in the community um, that's already working with, with this particular population, this particular audience. And so that helps to hopefully they've been successful or had some modicum of success or have a finger on the pulse of the community and we can do some listening together this is this is about sitting in a circle or on a screen like we are now and really hearing what people are saying and needing and wanting and and i think that's really the the key is the, that listening piece do you have a suggestion for organizations especially in, 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 you know, I'm thinking of the, the Los Angeles MPA Collaborative as, as we strive to, to find partnerships to be able to address. And, and it hasn't been people say, you know, I want to go to the beach, I want to learn more about MPAs, but, but to start building those relationships. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's complex. MPAs, you know, I remember when we were first starting to talk about MPAs, probably I don't know, eight or nine years ago and starting wow. 13. <laughs> wow. Okay. It's been that long. It's been a long time. I remember when we were first starting to talk about that. And I think one of the problems that a lot of people don't know about it, a lot of people don't know what a marine protected area is or how it came about. Um, I think that, you know, having a campaign that tells people about marine protected areas, shares what's happening there, shares why they're important especially if you can tell stories about it, like the beautiful work that Steffi does and, and tell stories about why these areas are important and why we need to protect them would be really the first step. Okay, thank you. And I know we have some students with us tonight and I'm so glad and, and I'm guessing based on some of these questions, but also people who are interested in, in the careers you've talked about. Oh boy. And, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, the pathway that you've gotten there and, and like many of us it's not a straight line but you hold true 
to what you believe in and what you know, and I know that from knowing you. Um, Trina asks, where can we go to learn more about the types of careers that you've mentioned? Oh, goodness. That's a very good question. Where do you go to learn about these types of careers? I don't know, but you know what? I will find out and I will get back to you. You know, I feel like, excuse me, I feel like environmental education, which is the field that I'm primarily working in, and then the diversity space, kind of combining those things. So many of us have written our own stories. Uh, we haven't like followed a pre-designed pathway. You know, I definitely started out um, advising eco clubs at high schools in Orange County. You know, that's how I started out. And uh, then moving on to helping people do beach cleanups and then doing science on the beach and then moving from that to, um, <clears throat> you know, working at different, you know, environmental nonprofits and combining that work with my love of, of building networks and bringing people together. So, um, gosh, if you wanted to do something like that, I definitely think looking in the nonprofit, the NGO sector would be helpful. Yeah. Right. And together, maybe we can combine. Do you need to get something to drink? I know it's hard to be. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I think together we can combine resources. I know um, Trina's real appreciative of, of you being able to look at that. And Elizabeth asked, for students interested in this area, are there internship opportunities during the pandemic? How would a student find these opportunities? Yes, I definitely think so. I know that, you know, in my work with, we had 103 active organizations in the environmental education sector in the Creek Network, the California Regional Environmental Education Network that I mentioned. And there was not one of them that didn't need help. <clears throat> there was not one of them that didn't need interns. So what I would do is think about the sort of thing you want to do. Of course, there are museums, there are science-based organizations. We had everyone from, you know, Lockheed Martin's a member of the Creek, the Creek Network to all the way to, you know, tiny little, our beautiful roundhouse aquarium, right? So every single one of these organizations needed help and needed, would love to have an intern or someone come and, and be a part of that work. And so what I would do is figure out what sort of thing you want to do. Do you want to work on climate change? Do you want to work on air quality with AQMD? Do you want to work on, you know, tree planting with tree people, wonderful organization? Do you want to work, you know, what sort of thing do you want to do? And once you um, figure that out, contact them and let them know of your interests. And there's, there are always so many wonderful internships. So that's, that's never going to be a problem. Everybody needs help. And during the pandemic, while you may not be leading students on an eco tour, you will definitely still, there's, there's so much research to be done. I have an intern that today was her last day. She was a beautiful, wonderful summer intern who did a ton of research for me from her house in Santa Barbara, nowhere near me. So yeah, definitely, definitely um, opportunities for that. And, and Elizabeth, if you're interested, many of those organizations, Candace mentions, um, are all partnering with LA Unified School Districts and looking for extra hands and extra help. And I'm more than happy to connect you um, if you'd like to be engaged in doing some of that outreach and education of connecting students to the outside um, while still having to be inside. Yeah. And Elizabeth asks, what would you recommend for someone who's trying to take these ideas and steps internationally? Hmm. You know, there are some really great international organizations that are doing work. So I know, you know, Greenpeace is international. Um, the pla there's a plastics organization that, of course, I'm blanking on their name right now. They do amazing international work. Um, I would also look at NAAAE. That's the North American Association for Environmental Education. Um, it is only North America, so it's Canada, the U.S., and, and Mexico, but they have just tons of international opportunities that come up, that, that pop up. They have a, a listserv that they send out for opportunities, so I would look at that, and international opportunities are always listed. Thank you. To, um, and if you have any other questions, please please share those. Um, we'll, we'll come back to them, and we're going to... Go ahead on to our next panelist, but thank you again, Candace, so much for being here today. Sure. And, and promise we'll come back with more. Um, and our next panelist tonight is Holly Souther. She has a bachelor's in science with a concentration in marine biology from Cal State University Fullerton. 
She has experience communicating biological concepts to a wide variety of audiences. Um, and, and here again, Roundhouse comes up because that's one of the partners she's worked with in out, as an outreach educator. And she's also been a classroom teacher. She uses also her experience with social media and being able to communicate and is serving currently as the social media specialist for the Marine program. And we've heard and talked a little bit about that earlier with our panelist, Steve Lee, um, on the first round table. And she also is a technician working with the Marine program. And I'd like to turn things over to Holly. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully everyone can see that. So hi everyone. Um, I'm Holly Suther. I work alongside Dr. Jennifer Burniford from Cal State Fullerton as a lab tech for the multi-agency Rocky Intertidal Network, also known as Marine. Um, I also happen to manage the social media for Marine. I've worked, like Linda said, as an outreach educator for Roundhouse Aquarium, taught high school bio, and led some supplemental bio courses um, and sessions at Cal State Fullerton. So it's been in my experience as an educator that I found many of the behaviors or attitudes that we might see as like concerning or even problematic tend to stem from a lack of knowledge on the subject or maybe even a belief in, in common misconceptions. And so what I found is to kind of um, help uh, assist in that is uh, educating people and being at their level and striving, what I'm tr currently trying to do is strive to use social media as a tool to convey scientific ideas and spread awareness and overall just communicate the importance of the inner title in kind of like an easy to digest and accessible way that, that works for, for everyone that, that uses it. And so in terms of common misconceptions, um, what I've run into most um, these are these are a few of the ones that I've run into more commonly. And first of all, it's it's surprising to some of us, but to some of us not really. Organisms for some folks aren't really recognized as living things or animals in terms of what lives in these tide pools in the inner tidal region. Um, for example, I would do field trips where we would take many students um, down to the inner tidal, and students and even adults that were there would be surprised to learn that barnacles and limpets and mussels were alive. They were living things, they were animals that they were being able to, to witness and interact with there. Another one is that uh, organisms aren't necessarily harmed by picking them up or holding them or, or taking them around when you're visiting the inner tidal. And I've often found when in the inner tidal, I see people like putting organisms into buckets and pails, like parading them around for photos without really that acknowledgement or regard that it's again like a living thing that's from the ocean <laughs> and another is that organisms can't be harmed by walking through the inner tidal now this misconception can it's it's very common and trampling is often overlooked and many don't realize the impact that trampling can have on like algae or barnacles or other marine organisms in the inner tidal and the last one which is one that i've seen more recently is that there's a misconception that the sea urchins that we see in our tide pool areas in Southern California are being deemed as like harmful or invasive and even uh, being encouraged to kill them because they're, they're seen as like being harmful to the tide pool environments. And this one I've noticed stems from a, a bit of a misunderstanding on the differences between intertidal and subtidal kelp systems but all of these misconceptions in general uh, contribute to these behaviors that we're witnessing in the inner tidal that have an impact on that system. So in terms of the steps I am trying to take in terms of using social media to combat these misconceptions is I want to increase awareness and understanding of the system uh, for everyone that's engaging with social media and encourage good stewardship. And these are the first like preliminary steps that I've been taking um, well, with working with the Marine program to try and achieve these goals. And 
it's important to note that these are preliminary steps that are currently being taken, but will always like lead to more um, important next steps like translating information into other languages and broadening the audience. But the first thing that I really focused on was gathering information from what is currently being posted on social media. And I wanted to know who is visiting the inner title, who's posting about the inner title, um, what organisms are being interacted with in the inner title, why are they being taken or harvested or collected. And it was really interesting to do these kinds of searches like uh, there's so much you can find on like Instagram or on Facebook groups or on Twitter or Reddit or forums on foraging that that give you a lot of information on the motivations behind people that are visiting the inner title, the kind of interactions that are happening with organisms there, just the, the system in general. And then once I was able to like gather information on this, I wanted to develop deliberate posts that educate people on things like responsible collecting, um, good stewardship, and even kind of educate on specific taxonomic groups that we were seeing being more heavily impacted or more like species of concern. And so, for example, I'm showing some example posts that we have um, that I developed. So for the stewardship side focused post, we tried to uh, pose it as like etiquette and um, how, how we would all want to be in the inner title when visiting to keep it pristine, to keep it healthy, to keep it beautiful. So everyone that visits gets that experience of when you get to go to the beach and you get to see all the colors and, and all the organisms in the tide pool and that kind of magical moment that, that we've talked about from other speakers too about visiting the inner title. We, we want to keep that there. And so the stewardship focus uh, touches on like this is a beautiful system that we are privileged to be able to visit and we want to make sure that we don't want to take from that um, unnecessarily or irresponsibly or um, just uh, collect sea creatures for like photos on Instagram and that kind of thing. And then the taxonomic focus posts are more focusing on species of concern, like for example, to try and combat the uh, we should be killing sea urchins from Southern California because they're deemed invasive from a misunderstanding. Let's talk about how sea urchins are helpful. What do they provide for our Southern California intertidal regions? Like how do they benefit being um, a part of this ecosystem? Why should we care about them? And so using different posts like this to try and almost advocate for um, more awareness of these species so it's not just uh, something that you're stepping over when you're visiting the beach to try and get pictures of the waves and stuff. We, we want to bring more focus on these organisms, um, what's so special about them, why they're deserving of a, a little more attention on this. And lastly another example of we want to uh, really push the almost like the leave no trace slogan of when we're here like if we can uh, make sure that we're leaving a, uh, a positive impact on the space that we get a positive impact from visiting. And so in terms of how these posts have been doing on our Instagram, our Instagram is marine underscore Pacific Rocky inner title, if anyone's interested. Uh, engagement has been pretty consistent and similar between these two different types of posts that um, we've been, you know, blasting out with. And um, in terms of learning about what makes a successful post, I've learned that there are certain features um, and tools on social media that can be utilized to make social media posts that specifically um, w have the goal of like educating or spreading awareness, uh, how to garner more engagement for them. And some of those include using tags of common locations of like inner tidal or tide pool regions, using relevant hashtags that people would often be searching using um, your collaboration network. So other organizations that would be willing to share your posts to their stories to kind of have that community uh, spread of these, of these information, using stories in general to do like activities, to share, do Q and A sessions, stuff like that can be really useful in having people quickly engage with it. And it doesn't take them having to read through a post, scroll through feeds and stuff like that. Stories are very useful. 
And then in general, when designing posts, making sure that they're easy to digest in terms of the text and the content, having aesthetically pleasing layouts, and including photos that will catch people's eye and draw them in. Because we are trying to talk to a more broad audience that isn't necessarily going to uh, go straight for the picture of the barnacle because they know that that's a barnacle. And so in general, what I found um, is that these posts can be a really good way uh, of kind of engaging with people and, and kind of breaking up the feed in terms of like, if you go to hashtag tide pools, there's a lot of posts of people uh, filming their kids with hammers smashing barnacles, which can be kind of upsetting. But if we break that up with like a post that's like, here's why barnacles are important and what they contribute to the ecosystem, any sort of thing like that, that kind of conveys a more positive message and, and um, encourages good stewardship there, kind of uh, encourages other people that see that to, to follow one side more so than the other. And so, like I said, this is very preliminary stuff and we are uh, working on broadening that, doing more important steps to um, be more inclusive and make sure that it is accessible for for more people than just people that are on Instagram or that, that use Instagram. And um, yeah, so far that's what we're working on. But I would love if there's any questions um, or any suggestions, we're, we're definitely open to things like that. Thank you so much, Holly, for sharing your progress on yeah. that and, and responses that folks have had. Um, you know, it's, it's really powerful to have Scientists coming together and finding ways to outreach and communicate about the work they do in a way that was was effective. Yeah. And Parker asks, what are some hashtags you found that are the most helpful? That's a great question. So um, it it can be really tricky because, for example, there's a hashtag tide pool and the hashtag tide pools. And you would be surprised the difference in the amount of engagement that can happen between two hashtags that the only difference them is the plural. Um, and so I found that hitting really generic ones, which are what people, if you're thinking about someone that's, that's not like scientifically uh, trained in understanding like the inner tidal system would use on their beach day of like looking up uh, inner tidal or like tide pool or beach posts, it's SoCal, it's tide pool, it's beach day, uh, stuff like that that's really broad that, that everyone would use. And that's where we find um, more people are engaging with those. Thank you. Um, in, in, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of responses, I saw how many likes. Have you had feedback from anyone who's, who's had concern about your posts? Um, in terms of like concerns about them, we haven't gotten anything. We have gotten um, interest in learning like specifically more about like the data behind certain things, which I, uh, with like a scientific background, love to, to get comments like that on those. Um, but I feel like with it's still pretty preliminary and we have only a handful of posts out, I feel like with more um, and potentially more spread of that, We'll, we'll hopefully get more engagement with the community in terms of both positive and concerns. Terrific. And so anyone can repost your posts. Absolutely. And spread the word wider of, of what you're posting and, and raise awareness. Yeah. And again, that's a really wonderful part of scientists being involved in this is, as I think everyone wants to know, well, how do you, how do you know that? <laughs> what, what are the, the at, what's the evidence? Yeah. And that. So that's really terrific and, and being able to respond to that. Katrina asks, in order to broaden youth education, would you consider expanding the marine social media to more platforms such as Twitter or TikTok, where there are many users who are teenagers? I think that is a great question. Um, I recently, like within the past couple of weeks, have been working on establishing the marine Twitter, which uh, in I, I, kind of swim within the academics uh, community on Twitter. And so I definitely would need to um, kind of plant myself within more of the, the teenage side of, of Twitter for that. But in terms of TikTok, I have uh, been investigating. There are some very successful 
um, like marine institutes that have and um, marine research centers that have TikToks that do little like creature features and, and stuff like that that are very engaging and very helpful in kind of um, educating younger folks on these unique creatures. And so I definitely see that as a possibility. So a question that came up with Candace earlier is, is, is this possibly a way where a high school intern could work with you this summer who's got that connectivity and social media expertise for, for TikTok to work I, also at, at addressing some of that? I think having a perspective from those that are much more aware of <laughs> what uh, like Gen Z are up to is always beneficial, yeah. Terrific, okay. I'm just trying to make those connections. That's what we do. Of different people working together. Um, Lorraine shares there's been a long history of blaming urchins, um, which she's been very vocal about since the 1970s, and it's still going on. And she uses the segment era talks about urchins and the real causes and problems of sea urchin overpopulation. So appreciates that you chose that species to be able to focus on. That's um, true. Lisbeth asks, have you thought about informing communities about those invasive and overpopulated species, but still in that positive way? It's simply to have information there so people know what's going on in the inner title. I think that's a really good question. And it kind of ties on um, something that we spoke about uh, earlier, at least Linda in the panelist chat about, there's this thin line about um, wanting to um, educate and and really bring awareness and not really do too much like doom and gloom. We don't want to have everyone be aware that the sky is falling in terms of the things that could be happening in the inner title that um, could be seen as as more negative, but it it's all um, in the name of science and in being like upfront and honest. I think it's important to to acknowledge these things and we definitely push that like we have for Marine there's long-term data that's being collected at these sites and it's publicly available on our website. So anyone can can access that and see that what changes, what everything that's been happening for the past 20 years or so at specific sites up and um, down the coastline to see these, if changes are happening, if, if certain species, um, the species that are being monitored and stuff uh, and so it's definitely accessible and it's a really good idea to, to think about how can we um, maybe take pieces of that data set and then convey that to the public um, or make that even more accessible for anyone who maybe doesn't have a background in interpreting graphs and, and such. That's terrific. Thank you. And I want to invite Candice back to joining us as well as we look at more questions from, from the entire group. Thank you. I was hoping you were there. <laughs> and um, Melody mentions it's, it seems easy to get attention from ocean people um, with hashtag on Instagram, but do you have an idea of how to get attention from folks who are not considered ocean people? Is there a good hashtag that you found works? And Candace, do you have suggestions on, on that? Either way. Holly or Candace? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Candace. I was, I was just going to say, it's really interesting, this idea of who is and who is not an ocean person. Like, I find that fascinating. And so, you know, one of the things that, um, projects that I work on is the California Environmental Literacy Initiative. And the, uh, we just call it Cali for short. And it started out with writing the blueprint for environmental literacy for the state of California. And then we kind of transitioned into this, this, this initiative. Um, to kind of implement the recommendation of the blueprint. But one of the things that we found, especially in working with um, certain, just certain communities, especially a particular community that's down by the San Diego border, is that people doing environmental work don't always consider themselves to be environmentalists. People who are doing really important work that contribute to the, the ecological health of their environment, that educate people about ways to, to help different, different areas of the environment, don't always consider themselves environmentalists. So while I don't have an answer for how to hashtag that, I'm going to leave that to Holly. I do love the idea that um, we need to make sure that we are speaking to people who maybe don't label themselves in certain ways and people who who don't fall under that that wonderful 
umbrella hashtag of, of ocean people. I'm, I'm really glad that came up. I, th I think you bring up a lot of really good points and, and the question is very uh, relevant, like doing certain hashtags of those that uh, already follow like marine conservation on Twitter and stuff, though they're, they're going to get these posts and they're the ones that are already pretty much aware of everything that, that we're talking about. They, they're the ones that if you're following the marine conservation hashtag, you're probably being a good steward of the inner title. And so a lot of the ideas that we talk about are how do we engage those that, that know nothing, that, that don't have any, any background on this necessarily. And um, we, we pull ideas back and forth. We try to broaden the tags that we use, tag in locations that are very common for, for like, it's not the, the site name, but it's like uh, Laguna Beach or the more broad ones that are more people would be using. And then we've also thrown around the idea of kind of even maybe utilizing like influencers. If you have someone that is um, seen by more people being able to just share a post that's like, hey, like I thought sea urchins were pretty cool when I went to the beach. Like just imagine, like I can't even fathom the impact that would have for all the people that they're like, well, my celebrity that I follow on Instagram likes sea urchins. So I'm not gonna <laughs> do things to sea urchins anymore kind of thing. So. There's definitely a lot of ideas that, that can be implemented and can be further developed in terms of that. Thank you. And Marissa comments that it's a wonderful idea of inclusivity to bring pieces of data finding to the general public via social media who may not have other ways of accessing the information or may not even know the information exists. Thanks, Marissa. And, and everyone, we really do want to open up. So if you have comments you'd like to make or you would like to um, be able to, to share information, please let us know. One of the things I do want to share while we're waiting for folks typing their questions is I will add a link in the um, chat also, Melody's added a link about the webinars and Steffi's added an animation if you want to watch them again. Um, but I also want to add a link to um, resources on the Rocky Inner Title. And we'll be adding additional resources about, about ways to, to build connectivity with, with social justice. And Candace and Holly, come back, please, because I need your help. Um, and and Linda and Melody was answering. I hope Linda's question of of what site to watch the previous two webinars, and so that's available as well. Um, and the artwork will be posted there, um, so you'll be able to look at all of those. Um, I I do want to talk about with the time that we've got. If if there's not another question that pops in my way, and in the meantime is. How do, we, how do we look at this nexus of, of people, you know, legally, it's okay to collect or tie to life with limits, and those limits are set, set by fish and wildlife, and we've heard in previous webinars that that, that is something that's going to be reconsidered for invertebrates. Um, but in the meantime, how do we balance to ensure that we're welcoming, that we're providing education, both about how important it is to have cultural connections and that sometimes those cultural connections include eating seafood. And many, many people eat seafood, whether it's seaweed or, or animals um, from the ocean. Um, and with protecting these, these areas and, and natural resources. And if there's anyone who has suggestions, I'd, I'd certainly be interested. Um, in hearing more, just even bouncing that thought amongst ourselves. Yeah. So when you when you ask the question, how are how can we be welcoming, Linda? It brings up for me um, the fact that nature is is welcoming for for the most part. There are lots of. I mean, we can definitely talk about the reasons why certain people don't feel comfortable in certain places. We can talk about that. But in general, nature is welcoming. It's people. Who are not welcoming, and so that's I think where where the where the conversation needs to take place. Um, the beach or the 
the intertidal zone or, or the tide pools as we call them in my house and we head on down there to take a look at things. Uh, the tide pools themselves are, are there and the idea that they're for everyone and that everyone can come, that, that is welcoming. Um, and I don't think, I, I know I've never felt unwelcome, you know, in, in, in these areas, it's never been an issue, but there are times where people do feel unwelcome. And it's, we have to remember that it's people and sometimes signs made by people <laughs> that make people feel unwelcome. And so I think the question is, why is that? How did that happen? And, and what, is, what is happening there? Because I think that for the most part, you'll find um, there is a desire to do, to do good, right? I know a thing or two about doing good at the do-goodery, but uh, there's a desire to do, to do good or to protect something. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we balance that desire with the desire to be inclusive and to include everyone and to respect different people's ways of doing things, as long as those things are not dangerous or harmful or, or awful. And if they are, then there's, there's a, there are different ways to approach that. There are different solutions for that. Yeah, thank you. Did you have anything you wanted to show in that, Holly? Um, I really appreciate everything that, that Candace had to, to say on, on that point. I think it's, uh, there's definitely so many different um, lines that intersect on this topic that it's, it's hard to just talk about. It's hard to just talk about like social media and, and feel, and not feel like I'm ignoring all the different um, other intersections that, that are involved with that in terms of accessibility and inclusivity and and acknowledging the 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 differences there um, and so I feel like it's it's a lot more than um, like beyond my field of just one person with it and definitely beyond my uh, like a hour and a half seminar in terms of the the complexity of it but I think the more dialogue that we have and uh with people um and the more engagement we have with folks can can really um as long as it's using like res based off of respect and and not shaming and and making uh like candace said doing a lot of listening with it i feel like there's only like net positives that can come from further engagement with this yeah, that, that listening, 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 I think stands out for all of us of how very, very important it is. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and I think part of, of asking you that also, Holly, was, was a question from Lorraine about addressing the disinformation and misinformation um, that's often posted on social media and so that people don't know what to believe and are reluctant to, to accept or, or understand um, and believe in anything. Um, you know, how do we build that believability? And, and that is such a good question and such a relevant question for the, the times that we are in. And one that is is very difficult to answer. And I don't think I necessarily have a a answer, uh, like a solution for that yet. Uh, because it's definitely something that is struggled with every day. Even when I like go on my own like personal Twitter, like one things are hard to believe because of the just the sheer like catastrophe that everything that pops up on my feed is in a lot of cases. But then being able to parse out um, what is true and what is kind of um, kind of stretched in terms of things is a whole nother challenge. And I feel very privileged that I do have some amount of training in understanding like how to read data and how to read graphs and, and how to parse through like scientific literature to be able to fact check for myself. But a lot of people don't have those resources or those skills. And so it is very tricky um, to, to try and uh, be like, don't believe what they said because that's not true, but believe me because I'm better somehow. And, and how do we convey that without like putting down others? It's very tricky. <laughs> no, it's such a big question. And you know, it comes up time and time again in different arenas too. And so when we were working on like the Blueprint for Environmental Literacy that I mentioned earlier, um, the DiCaprio Foundation took note and they actually gave us some funding because 
as you, as you, I'm sure you all know, if you follow Leonardo DiCaprio online, he's very, very big on climate change, indigenous, uh, things like that. And so the DiCaprio Foundation funded the California Environmental Literacy Initiative because there was a deep desire to make sure there was environmental literacy in school, that students learned how to think for themselves. They learned about the environment. They learned about um, the environmental principles and concepts which frame the, the work in California. The environmental principles and concepts are in the science framework in the state of California. They're in the health framework. They're in the social science framework. These, these principles and concepts, things like people um, depend on natural systems. People can, natural systems change in ways that people can benefit from and influence. These are, these are the environmental principles and concepts. And if people have a, if we can get students in California a strong foundation in, in these principles and concepts, we can help to increase the environmental literacy and then create these new um, thoughtful citizens. I, I say all the time when I'm working with high school students, these are students that are gonna be voting in the next election. All the students I've worked with are, are you know, they're, I've been out of the, the field for just a tiny little bit of time here, but a, many, many of the students, the vast, vast majority of students I work with in environmental literacy work are voting in this next election. And that's what we want. We want to make sure we're creating environmentally literate students who then, as we know, go home and, and help to educate their families, educate their parents. I'm so, um, so encouraged by this new generation. I'm so encouraged by the things that I see. And I'm not on TikTok because I don't get it. But um, <laughs> I'm still super encouraged by the things that filtered their way to Instagram where I hang out. Um, it's really, really cool and really important. I'm, I'm so glad you bring up how important the youth are. And, and it's something I think many of us who are in the education field realize that oftentimes youth become the bridges to their families and youth become the bridges, especially in, in where there's language barriers. And, and Marissa asked, you know, how do you, how do you navigate that? How do you approach and work with, with individuals out in the environment when you are lacking in knowing more languages than English and, and don't have that ability to communicate and the idea of you know, engaging youth who often have that access through school and have developed those skills. Any other suggestions or ideas of how we can, um, how we can work better with communities where we don't have the same language? Yeah, I think it goes back to that partnership piece. This is not about me heading out there with my, I don't know what I would take, <laughs> but me <laughs> heading out there with whatever I would take. Um, and, and making an attempt as an individual to like, you know, talk to this person. It's about there, there are groups that, that are working in these communities, partnering with those groups, making sure that you, that we are creating strategic partnerships so that we are understanding what the needs and concerns and issues and just priorities of the communities that we want to reach. And so, um, it is difficult to get an environmental or any sort of message across when you when you're just going to go out there and be a, a lone crusader but in in a group and in a team and in a community we can do so much more thank you and and trina adds listen to learn not to reply that's always the toughest um, and it's one of her favorite mindsets Ariel asks, is there any way to work with the state education department to create mandatory NGSS aligned environmental literacy courses for high school seniors? Oh, believe me, there's <laughs> a lot of work going on for that. Um, and it's not just for high school seniors. The environmental, environmental literacy initiative is a K through 12 initiative and it is about ensuring that the environmental principles and concepts are integrated into so much of what the students do. So the idea that um, Dr. Lieberman, uh, through the work with 10 Strands, um, is writing, has already written uh, the new, the work with the new science framework to embed the environmental principles and concepts and to embed the environmental principles and concepts into the health framework and embed the environmental principles and concepts to the social science framework. What that means is that the textbooks have to include those ideas. Um, that these things are, are now being in with NGSS, that's the next generation science standards for people who aren't familiar. 
there is an assessment. There was a very long period of time where science wasn't taught in the same way in the state of California under No Child Left Behind. It was very much a, um, very much about math and, you know, English language arts. Now with science being, uh, being there's an assessment, there are science standards, there's been adopted by the state of California, we're seeing that integration and we're seeing that people are trying to build that bridge so that teachers can see that using the environment as a teaching tool is the, is the perfect way to in, in not only engage their students, but to actually meet their goals in teaching the things that they want and te need to teach. I could talk about that all night. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can, and I can't believe that our time has come to an end. Um, thank you so much, Holly, for sharing your skills and expertise and, and Candace for sharing yours um, and Steffi, um, I'll pass that on. And thank you for, for participants, um, those who have attended tonight. Thank you to the team who helped make this happen each time that we've had the round table. Gwen Noda for your help and Melody Grubbs from the Sea Grant program. Phyllis for, for your support in this and, and Julie and Jim for all the work that you put into this. Um, we still have challenges, and, and I think none of us said everything's done. Um, it's all of us joining together, and I think we all can continue the work toward more equitable access and finding ways to reach solutions as a larger community, sharing respect and support and communicating with one another. And thank you for sharing um, some strategies and ideas and for enlightening me and helping me see some other possibilities. And I'd like to leave the last few minutes for Julie Passarelli from Cabrillo Marine Aquarium to also um, share her thoughts with all of you. Thanks, Linda. I, I just want to thank the panelists as well. Um, this was a, um, a fantastic uh, trilogy. And um, thanks again to our partnership with USCC Grant and Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And a big thank you to Linda for moderating tonight. And once again, um, if you missed the first two roundtables, they are recorded. They are posted on both Cabrera and Aquarium's uh, website and USC Seagrads uh, website. And we're gonna be posting tonight's roundtable soon. So all three will be posted and um, um, you can share them and Thank you again for everybody joining us and um, thank you and good night. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you to the aquarium as well. And please keep your questions coming. We're happy to connect you with panelists and we'll also be posting answers from the first panel. Um, we're still collecting some of those. So they're all coming in and we'll get them to all of you. Thank you all very much. Have a good night.